Hi, everybody. Um, just a few words before I start about uh, Sterlite Power. Uh, so I'm from Sterlite Power, uh, and we are the largest private transmission developer in, in the country, uh, as well as one of the leading transmission developers in Brazil. Um, in addition to our core uh, transmission development business, we have also uh, recently started the energy storage business, uh, which is what I head at Sterlite, uh, where we're looking to develop utility scale energy storage solutions uh, for grid applications. So with that, uh, what I'll briefly cover today is some of the applications of grid scale storage that need to be kept in mind when thinking about business models. Uh, a brief look at business models around the world, the pros and cons along with that, uh, and then the applicability in the Indian context. And then if we have time at the end, we'll uh, 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 talk about a few sample business case numbers. So before we get into business models, it's important uh, to set the context of the, the business model, which is, uh, depends a lot on the application and the location of uh, a storage asset. Uh, so just really briefly, uh, anything that is coupled to a generator before uh, the point of interconnection for the generator would be called a generation coupled storage. Uh, anything that is connected at the transmission uh, or distribution grid, either at the pooling station level, at a transmission substation or at a distribution substation, uh, could be classified as energy storage as a grid asset. Uh, and then finally, anything that is behind the meter uh, on the consumer end is classified as behind the meter storage. So my presentation on business models today is excluding anything behind the meter, uh, just setting the context there. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, business models as applicable to uh, grid scale energy storage, or utility scale energy storage. So really quickly, uh, I'm sure these applications have been covered in uh, multiple uh, presentations over the last three days. Um, but when you talk about uh, energy storage as a grid asset, really, and again, with, the, with an India context as well, um, peaking capacity or peak shifting is one aspect of it. Um, the other is renewable en energy integration. If you want to think about that differently, you can think about that as shifting a renewable energy peak from the time of peak generation to peak demand. That is optimization of generation. Uh, the reason why this is uh, separate, I have considered that separate from renewable energy is you can also tie energy storage assets along with conventional thermal plants. Uh, and Vibhu gave a great example uh, with, with the GE uh, uh, plant that they've added storage onto to reduce the ramping requirements, improve response times, uh, and overall improve uh, economics of uh, a conventional traditional generation plant as well. There's ancillary services. These are generally uh, the most lucrative in any market when that starts. Uh, but then the quantum of ancillary, or uh, quantum of storage required for ancillary services in a country is pretty limited. Uh, you can classify an additional application as spin, non-spin reserves. Uh, and then TND deferral, uh, which is applicable to a utility or transmission or a distribution utility and can defer capital upgrades uh, to into the future. And even though I've mentioned that last, it's definitely not the least. As you can see from the graph on the right, uh, in a lot of cases, the locational benefit of where you site the storage yields one of the biggest value that a storage system can provide. And so this is just an uh, example from a Lazard analysis uh, for uh, energy utility scale storage in uh, the California, New York, and ERCOT markets. Uh, again, it's a sample representation, but what it brings out is the green piece of the middle column is the locational benefit of siting the storage at a particular area in New York uh, that yields the maximum value in, in terms of a business case. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we think about uh, business models for energy storage going forward. And then the second thing uh, is We've talked about this often, which is that energy storage is a very versatile asset. Um, to use uh, an abuse term, it's a Swiss Army knife of, of sorts uh, and can be used for multiple applications. And the true value uh, of storage is, is yielded when you can stack applications uh, to, to maximize value application, uh, uh, value of, from the storage device. Uh, this is just an example, again, a sample from a Brattle study that showed that uh, the benefits of stacking could be two to three X that of any individual application on its own. And why I've mentioned this will be clear uh, in, over the next couple of slides. So now that we've talked about location and the value maximization through stacking, 
Um, let's talk about three broad business models uh, that are used for deploying energy storage uh, around the world. And again, this is an attempt at classifying those. Uh, there are obviously uh, newer developments that put business models at somewhere on the middle of two of these. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but broadly, if you locate the battery alongside generation as shown in the first slide, uh, you can call a generation coupled, a grid asset is transmission and distribution grid in front of the meter, and merchant asset is uh, anywhere on the grid where there is a market for certain electric, uh, electric requirements. Uh, the ownership, again, is uh, on the generation side with uh, generators or IPPs. Uh, as a grid asset, it can be owned by independent st storage providers or developers, or by regulated utilities, as, uh, again, uh, was shown in the SCE case. Uh, and then merchant asset is typically owned by independent storage providers. The dispatch of the asset, now this is, uh, th this is one, uh, an important point uh, when it comes to maximizing value. Uh, so in a generation coupled asset case, the dispatch uh, is, lies with the IPP. Uh, as a grid asset, you can leave the dispatch with a system operator or at least give it market signals, uh, which is what you get in case of merchant asset. Uh, Application-wise, uh, generation coupled asset is, uh, you would have heard it most commonly being used to firm RE or shift RE from uh, a time of peak generation to peak demand. Uh, and like I said, in sometimes in the case of ramping thermal uh, conventional plants. A grid asset can, uh, can service all of those applications, um, uh, either the, on the firming side or ramping side, as well as uh, on a grid deferral or grid reliability aspect as well. Um, and then in the merchant asset case, the applications depend on the existence of a market. In the case of India, uh, we can think about energy arbitrage as, as one application that a merchant asset could be used for, but we don't have a capacity market, we don't have a frequency regulation market as of yet. Uh, and so the applicability of a merchant asset model in India is limited as of now, but as we develop our markets, uh, the, the potential to, to use that business model increases. And then, from a contracting perspective, a generation coupled asset uh, would have the storage paid for by baking in the cost of storage into the cost of the PPA itself. A grid asset typically would have a fixed uh, payment, uh, either in terms of a, an availability-based payment or um, in, if it's owned by the utility as a, as a rate-based revenue requirement. Uh, and then a merchant asset obviously would have uh, uh, revenues based on participation in merchant markets. And so evaluating, so I'll be using these two uh, key uh, levers to evaluate the applicability of a business model, again, when it comes to India. And uh, these two are value maximization, in, in which business model allows you to maximize uh, the value of the asset, and which one improves the bankability uh, of the asset. A generation coupled asset uh, has a, a, a medium uh, value maximization because dispatch priority is to maximize generate, uh, generator value and not system benefits. Um, and often it is behind the interconnection point of uh, a generation um, uh, generator, which means that it will be limited by the interconnection size of that generator. Um, and so, for example, if you, were to, uh, if you were to need the storage asset for system services at the time of peak generation at 12 noon, uh, you may not be able to get to use that because it's by default, by, by definition, behind the meter uh, or interconnection point of a generator. A grid asset, on the other hand, has uh, maximum value ma maximization, uh, not only because uh, a single dispatcher can dispatch the asset to, uh, to whatever application at that point in time is yielding the maximum uh, value, but because also you can locate it as per the needs of the grid to deliver maximum value. Um, in a merchant asset, uh, I've mentioned low. This is uh, specifically for the India case. Uh, I've said low, uh, again, because of the absence of uh, multiple markets with deep volumes and participation. On the bankability end, um, from our experience in, in participating in certain storage uh, tenders and uh, projects, we found that banks uh, place a higher uncertainty when the revenue for a storage project is linked to the volume of generation uh, for obvious reasons, because uh, you never know in a given year or in a given month or a given uh, week what your revenues are gonna be. And if, if a large portion of the project cost is based on 
your volumes, then, then there's an added risk. Whereas a grid asset, because of the benefit of having fixed uh, availability-based payment mechanisms, um, there is a, a high bankability value out there. And then the lowest bankability value is obviously for a merchant asset, because you never know what a market is going to do. Moving on, uh, doing an analysis of projects in the US. So we put together a database of all the projects greater than 10 megawatts done in the US uh, for storage. And we found that initially, uh, early on, a lot of the projects that were done were done a, 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 in a PPA model that is generation coupled. And we found when we dug a little deeper that the reason for that is very straightforward. Uh, we're talking about the US uh, where uh, there is a very lucrative incentive in the form of solar ITCs, and any storage project that gets coupled with a solar project gets to enjoy the same benefits. And so we saw a whole host of projects come early on uh, that were solar coupled and generation coupled. But the reason I point that out is that should not necessarily be the case by default for India, uh, primarily because the same incentive scheme doesn't exist here, and we shouldn't be deciding what business model we pick out here based on incentive schemes in other countries. Um, there is, uh, I've briefly called it a tolling model, but really uh, tolling covers a lot of uh, aspects. So when I say tolling plus merchant, which shows a maximum uh, share of projects, what that really covers is the fixed revenues, uh, quote, tolling, uh, that a lot of projects in California and uh, the West uh, recover in the form of uh, resource adequacy, et cetera. And so you'll see a lot of projects that uh, bank on the uh, RA payments and contracts, and then in addition participate in energy imbalance markets in California or uh, California ISO. Uh, and then the turnkey EPC uh, category really captures uh, what Vivu described as utility-owned uh, projects, where the utility owns the asset and, uh, ha and has uh, it constructed and delivered on an EPC basis. And then the ESPPA is really something new that you can see. Uh, is developing, uh, you, you'll see that uh, with the, the high profile Hawaii um, uh, procurements that are happening and have just happened where there is, they've separated the storage component from the generation component. The generation component is paid on a volume basis, but the storage component is based. Uh, there is a fixed component to that to pay for the storage uh, costs. The CERC um, recommended uh, in their discussion paper um, a, a few, uh, a year ago or more, uh, a number of different models uh, as we should consider all of these. And again, uh, while I'm pointing out the benefits and uh, uh, the pros and cons of different models, uh, in my view, it will be a combination of all of the above in some shape or form. Um, and so uh, the CERC, one of the models that they had recommended would be storage as a grid asset uh, where, like we have already discussed, the, there's high value, uh, high, high value maximization and bankability, um, primarily because of alignment of incentives and having a single dispatch uh, operator. Um, an RE generator could also be uh, an owner, like we discussed, uh, with the, with the uh, pros and cons of value bankability. One thing that is a pro for, RE, for a generation coupled asset is there is simpler cost recovery as well as there are some cost benefits to uh, citing it behind a in, uh, common interconnection point or even having a common inverter for uh, a generation coupled, a DC coupled uh, storage asset. Um, a DISCOM or an independent storage, uh, storage project could be on uh, the DISCOM side, owned by the DISCOM. Uh, the value would uh, arguably be the highest in that case, closest to the consumer, co closest to the load. Uh, but given the uh, situation, the financial health of DISCOMs in India from a bankability perspective, uh, th that presents a lot of other challenges. And then finally, uh, a merchant asset. Mr. Mehta, maybe two minutes more. Sure. Uh, and then finally, a merchant asset really, um, uh, as I've said before, needs the presence of more deep and uh, more uh, markets for uh, different capacities as well as frequency regulation, et cetera. So, this is one proposed model for an energy storage asset as a, a grid asset, where you have the storage asset on the right-hand side, uh, which is developed and owned by an independent st storage provider. It can be dispatched by the state load dispatch center, um, which, is, which can maximize the use of that asset for maximum system benefit. Um, the transco could be the owner of the asset and pay the fixed availability-based annuity 
uh, to uh, the, the owner, developer owner of the project, um, and in turn recover the cost or share the cost of the project uh, from with the discoms as well as uh, with the generators and open access customers based on how it actually dispatches the asset and who is utilizing the value from that from that asset. And then that asset can then thereon be used for multiple applications like peak shifting, DSM management, ancillary services, et cetera. Uh, we did a, a, a sample business case study for a renewable rich state in India. And again, these are indicative numbers. Uh, a lot of this will really depend on the location of the project. Every specific project will have a different number. So that is important to keep in mind. But this is just to give you an indication of what are the different benefits and value streams that might be accessible to a project like this. So obviously there is uh, the DSM penalty uh, mechanism in India, which, uh, which places a big, uh, represent a big cost uh, to utilities as well as um, open access customers and generators. Um, so a project like this has the potential, a 50 megawatt project, which is a three-hour system. Again, we've, did, we've done some uh, playing around with the, uh, with the combinations. Uh, in this case, a 50 megawatt project, three-hour system, could yield a value of about 21 crores per year uh, from, that, from DSM savings. Uh, after that, there is peak cost savings. Today, we've made some uh, really high-level assumptions in this case of peak cost being six rupees and off peak cost being 1.5. If that's the case, and depending on how often it's cycled in a year, uh, the value could be 30, 13 crore rupees a year. Uh, transmission deferral, again, would depend on urban areas, uh, generally would have higher transmission uh, costs, and hence the benefit of deferring it would be higher as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, in some areas, there is uh, a, a benefit to having standby uh, availability of generation. This is not true in all parts of India, in very specific cases. Um, but in, in that case, you can quantify that and, and uh, add that as another 10 crores per year as well. And so we come out to a, a, a total of about 57.5 crores in benefits. Um, and then on a, from a cost perspective, really, you're looking at capexes of uh, in the range of 300 crores for a project like this, and opex, which includes your cost of degradation and augmentation for 20 years um, so to, to maintain it at rated capacity. Uh, is pretty significant as well, and then there's conversion losses as well. And so, uh, again, we don't prefer this uh, kind of analysis to do break-even, but if you were to do a simple break-even analysis, you can see it's about six years you'd break-even, but this does not account for the financing cost of the project. So that needs to be taken into account. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'll look forward to your questions afterwards. Thank you.